A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. And Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you always. Whoever loves me will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Those who do not love me do not keep my words. Yet the word you hear is not mine, but that of the Father who sent me. I have told you this while I am with you. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Father Francis here on this Sunday of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the Holy uh, Feast of Pentecost. And uh, so may the blessings of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And that's it. That's the end of the homily. <laughs> almost, almost. Well, tonight, uh, this afternoon, late this afternoon, it's uh, June 6th as I am as I am making this homily for the Feast of Pentecost. June 6th uh, also has uh, another somber reminder. It is the 75th anniversary of the landing of D-Day. And uh, over 9,380 some odd young men on this day, by the end of this day, had forfeited their lives so that you and I can enjoy the liberties and the freedoms that we enjoy in this great country of ours. Um, also today, um, yeah, June 6th is my ordination anniversary. Not that that's anything really all that important, but it's significant uh, for me personally, 27 years. And, um, you know, getting back to the, the whole thing about D-Day, you know, I guess a lot of young men, when they um, joined up to to fight against, uh, you know, the, the Axis powers, um, you know, maybe some of them were filled with a lot of idealism, a lot of patriotism. You know, maybe they thought, man, I'll sure look good in one of them uniforms and I'll get that girl that I've been, you know, courting, you know, back home and she'll, you know, see me and maybe, uh, you know, think I'm a, a hero and will love me and, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe we'll get married and live happily ever after, after this war. Uh, maybe they were enticed by, you know, seeing other heroic young men and saying, I want to be like those guys. But in the very end, you know, um, when it got down to that one moment in their lives where they were probably taking fire and, you know, uh, having, uh, you know, skirmishers with the enemy, uh, it really kind of came down to the guy on their left, the guy on their right. And those were the people they were fighting for. True, uh, symbolically and uh, maybe metaphysically, they were certainly fighting for their country. And I'm sure that they were motivated by the love of their family at home, friends at home. But when it really came down to the nitty gritty, uh, it was that other guy in the foxhole to their right and to their left that they were fighting for thinking if I've got, I have a responsibility, I may not be able to fight this war all by myself, but I can fight it to where I can maybe save this guy's, you know, this guy's life and send these two guys home to, so they can be with their families for the rest of their lives. So it became very personal, it became very uh, intimate, if you will. And it becomes very immediate that this is who I'm fighting for. So... So today, you know, we look at uh, that concept of idealism. Um, I've been ordained 27 years, and, you know, I've had some good years, and I've had some bad years. Uh, I think a lot of people that are married can say that. They've had good years, they've had bad years. Um, and I have to say that this is turning out to be a pretty good year. Um, now, I would be less than honest to say that I have not had my doubts as to whether or not I did the right thing 27 years ago. Um, especially in light of the priest scandal, 
Uh, and unfortunately, knowing a, a couple of the priests, uh, even our own diocese, who have done unspeakable things, um, and you know, and, and knowing of others who have done unspeakable things, has it has it uh, put a, a dark cloud over my own uh, ministry and priesthood? Well, of course it has. Of course it has. But I have to tell you that somehow today, I have a, I have a new, uh, renewed optimism. And it's not kind of a, a Pollyannish uh, thing or something that's kind of unrealistic. Uh, it's just that my idealism has been tempered. Probably like that young man who, here he is standing on USA Street, Street of USA, you know, whatever, uh, and he's sitting, standing in front of a recruiting office and he sees the poster of the heroic young men in their uniforms and they're all gallant and tanned. And then he finally goes overseas and he has his own unique, real experience of what it means to be fighting for your country. And so it becomes very real. And obviously the idealism that maybe motivated him to join and sign up Maybe that has now been tempered. It's changed. Um, one of the interesting things I've seen in the last couple of weeks, uh, I have to be honest with you, there are two types of people in the world. Those who love uh, the sound of music and those who don't. Now, I have to say that probably most of us, most of you watching, probably love the sound of music. I don't know about you, but if, <laughs> there are times that if I'm really, really down, uh, if I just watch a musical... I tell you what, it just kind of picks me right up. So, um, but anyway, uh, the thing I was watching a documentary about the sound of music, and actually, what it was really about was the actual Maria von Trapp, uh, the lady whose uh, life is the, the sound of music is based upon the the von Trapp family singers. And uh, it was interesting because uh, one of the documentarians, as they were saying, well, you know, people. When they really met the real Maria von Trapp, they weren't that impressed. Uh, it was she was kind of a letdown. <laughs> now you have to remember that uh, the original Maria von Trapp, you know, she was first of all she was in her later years. She wasn't a vivacious young Julie Andrews type of a thing, you know. Uh, she wasn't uh, that kind of a person. She has she had uh, aged. She had uh, grown, you know, w- older with time, and so and, and clearly. The time, uh, you know, her, her life had shown on her face and and uh, maybe her voice wasn't as crystal clear as it once was. And so when people would meet the real Maria von Trapp, they were kind of like, oh, uh, it really tempered their idealism, you know, because it's not Julie Andrews, you know, swinging up the, on the beautiful mountain up there and singing, the hills are alive, you know. Um, I'm not going to do that, by the way. Uh, but the, the thing is that... Um, the real Maria von Trapp was, uh, well, for all intents and purposes, a very hard person. She was a, a she was a she was an orphan. She uh, had she didn't really have a very good home. I think her um, her stepfather, foster stepfather, was an alcoholic, and the the mother that uh, she had wasn't very uh, wasn't very loving. I think her actual her her actual her her own real mom gave her up. So the mother could go off and do medicine or something. It was kind of sad. Left her alone and kind of gave her away to a foster home when she was six, I think. So she really uh, had a very hard life. Uh, and so, but she, she, you know, part of the story is true. And so when she did marry the, the Captain Von Trapp and they did have their own family, the kids in the Von Trapp family uh, were pretty much... Uh, they were raised pretty strictly, and Maria was the real uh, taskmaster for all accounts. So she maybe wasn't the bubbly, happy-go-lucky, you know, creative, song-singing, you know, beautiful young woman. Uh, she was probably a kind of, you know, the kind of mom that says, okay, now it's time to do your piano lessons. Now it's time to do your recorder lessons. It's time to take your singing lessons. Time to take the trash out. Time to do your homework, you know. And so... Unfortunately, she was a taskmaster. She was a disciplinarian. And although, you know, a lot of kids today don't really like that, but she knew that that was the only way that they could probably succeed in life. So again, uh, comparing and contrasting the ideal with the reality. 
Well, the, the Feast of Pentecost, I think, kind of does that in a very real way. You see, the early disciples, you know, they had this idea that Jesus was going to be this great political liberator. In fact, they thought he was actually going to be the new uh, ruler of Israel. He was going to become king, and they were going to become nobles, and man, by golly, we're going to change the world. Well, you're going to change the world, but it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a whole lot different. And your ideals are going to have to kind of be, now, they're going to have to modify. They're going to have to be altered uh, to where we're, to, to uh, now assume and accept the real, the real uh, message of what God and is doing through this Jesus of his, 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 his only son. So the thing is that uh, with Pentecost, uh, it, uh, it now it helps the disciples. You see them going from being cowardly, uh, fearful, hiding behind locked doors to these men and women who went out into the world proclaiming that Jesus is the Christ, the risen one, the conqueror of sin and death, and that in his name we have life. If we, if we repent of our sins, then we will be saved. Um, even today, I'd have to say that, uh, sadly, the world uh, does not want to hear the authentic message uh, of Jesus Christ. They would like to hear an alternate ideal, uh, one that is not in keeping with the truths and the teachings of the Catholic faith, the truths and the teachings of Jesus himself. Uh, Jesus in the gospel today tells us that we love him, we will keep his commandments. Uh, and a lot of people today, sadly, do not want to keep his commandments. They want to do things their own way. Uh, and so, unfortunately, uh, that is their, their ideal gets kind of um, gets corrupted, if you will. You know, it's like a, a computer file. Once it gets corrupted, it, it's, you can't, it's, it's, it's no longer readable. You know, it just has to be deleted. Unfortunately, there are just a lot of people today, sadly, who have uh, altered uh, even the Christian message to include things that are are not that you cannot include. You know, a lot of these new uh, immorality uh, movements we see happening uh, in our society, and and unfortunately, people are confused, and uh, they really need help. They need prayers. They need understanding. Uh, but again, they have to be gently uh, corrected uh, because they are, they are missing uh, the point, if you will, of what Jesus really came to do. He came that we might have life, eternal life, and even this life we could have more abundantly. And that's what the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is all about. It's about that Holy Spirit taking the commandments of Jesus and not just writing them on our hearts, as important as that is, but he transforms these, what might seem as odious commandments, rules, and regulations into something that is irresistible, something that is delicious, because why? We are now motivated by love, not by law. And that's what the Holy Spirit came to do. He came to take the old commandment and write that into our hearts as the new commandment of Christ's love. And that's why we celebrate the Holy Spirit today. Come, Holy Spirit, come and enkindle the faith of your loved, of your beloved, your, your church, so that we might be your bold witnesses in the world today. Well, I hope you got something out of that this, uh, this day. And may God bless you in every day, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.